What are the brain waves? Delta is the first one. Here's an electrical wiring network, electrochemical network. Everything's running over the wiring in this brain and it's electrical frequencies and you, you smash this brain from one side or you twist it around and that trauma can cause shearing of those electrical wires. Now I'm gonna put you in the hyperbaric chamber and I'm gonna give you such a dose of oxygen, I'm gonna help you to recover faster. You've mapped my brain. Right. So what's going on up there? All right, so definitely working at full capacity. That's uh, good. We're looking at, as a model, the front of the brain here and the back of the brain towards me. And so I'm gonna give you kind of a, a couple of thoughts in general, and then we'll dive down into, I'll explain what I saw in the results. Okay. So in general, well, it's important for people to know there's different kinds of brain waves, and the brain is always oscillating. All the brain waves. So what are the brain waves? Delta is the first one. Delta is normal for sleep. So we all have delta brain waves. It's for sleep. So when we're asleep, our delta waves will be a bit higher than some of the other brain waves. So it's a slow, slow brain wave, as would be thought. Then you come up a little bit faster, you have theta. Theta is something where you're kind of dozing off, you're kind of drifting down into sleep. It's slowing your brain down, but it's not as slow as delta. Theta is also implicated in people. If you have a lot of theta brain wave in the middle of the day, you might have an attention problem because your brain's sluggish, it's slow and it can't stay on things that are changing quickly. Theta can also be controlled by people who meditate, so it might be a good thing that you can bring up your theta. So it's a slow brain wave, so you have delta is very slow, theta is a little bit faster, then you hit alpha. Alpha is like the gear shifter from slow wave to faster wave. And alpha is related to, at least attributed to, performance, a relaxed state of function where you can do what you need to do, but you're kind of in a good state, like a zen state, or you're in, your, you're in the right zone for an athlete. Oh, good. Right? You're not tense, but you're not completely falling asleep, but you're, you're mentally flexible, you're emotionally flexible, it's your alpha state. And even Tony Robbins, I believe, says that he trains for many hours to be able to stay in an alpha state because he's you know, leading these massive conferences and helping people have breakthroughs and things. So he's gotta really be on, on his game. Okay. So alpha is very good. We know that alpha decreases as we age. And, and we can see that in people many times because they get less flexible, more rigid, more frustrated with things that maybe when they were younger, like, no, not a big deal. Then you go up from alpha to beta. And beta is a big, big range of brain waves. They have low beta and high beta. And so high beta is if you have to solve something complex. I mean, you have so much technology here, it's almost like my office. And you need to be at a bit of high beta learning how to operate all this stuff. That's normal. But when you close your eyes to relax, a person shouldn't be in high beta. That can be associated with stress, anxiety, things of that nature. So. All the brain waves are normal. It depends on what the context is. So if I'm here talking to you, my brain is high in delta, that's not the proper context for that because it's for sleep. Or I'm trying to fall asleep and my brain has got a lot of high beta going on. I'm not gonna fall asleep very well because my brain is racing. So all the brain waves, we, all the way to, to beta, and then the highest ones that we record are gamma. Gamma is a very high frequency processing brainwave, something that helps you have insight, embeds memories very deeply. So gamma, we know, is damaged with head injuries. Okay. And also with people with Alzheimer's. And actually, MIT did some studies years ago on mice, you know, non-human uh, uh, studies. So not everything that's done in an animal model, we know transfers to an, a human, but where they they took a 40 hertz flickering light and 40 hertz would be at like part of the gamma uh, brainwave and they're all in hertz measured. And a 40 hertz flickering light reduced a lot of the placking in the brains of the mice or rats that they used. So they thought, oh wow, will a 40 hertz flickering light exposure to people with Alzheimer's and these different types of plaques improve them? 
So then, of course, many people jumped on that and started selling these lights that you could purchase and put in your desk that have 40 hertz flickering. And I bought one, curious. I put it just behind my computer. I think I got a headache the first day. <laughs> Because <laughs> I've had I've had a number of head traumas. I estimate five to seven concussions playing football, track and field pole vaulting, several rollover car accidents. So I've had my fair share of head impact. Never diagnosed with a concussion, but I'm noticing now at my age, mm, I think that's probably related to like I sweat more on one side of my body than the other. Really? Yeah, that's related to a brainstem injury. Okay. I think. I mean, how injured am I? I'm not that injured. I'm pretty functional. But I'm noticing that I think these things are related to some of the head impacts I took. Being more stressed, a little more trouble sleeping, you know. So I, I, I have little things that I notice. You know, you know yourself. You notice, like, mm, that's not really what I used to be like. So these frequencies, this alpha, beta, alpha. gamma, theta, delta. And delta. Um, so these, these are just, they're, they're frequencies? Yeah, they're electrical activity in your brain. How are they damaged? How is a frequency damaged? A frequency won't be damaged, but you can have too much of that brainwave or too little of that brainwave. How? Because of injury, number one, can change. Because you think about it, here's an electrical wiring network, electrochemical network, or you could even say electromagnetical, electromagnetic, but electrochemical network, right? Everything's running over the wiring in this brain and it's electrical frequencies and you, you smash this brain from one side or you twist it around and that trauma can cause shearing of those electrical wires. Okay. And the shearing is what causes those wires not to transmit properly. And because it's injured, just like you get inflammation in a knee that was injured or a shoulder, you can get neuro inflammation at that site of injury, which is gonna radically change the, the electrical activity. And there's signatures, meaning we know that certain, or what I mentioned earlier, these, this word called phenotypes, meaning certain brainwave patterns are related to certain conditions. Then you find out, did this person have that condition? They did. Then that's the kind of pattern. So let me be a little more precise. A brain injury, a traumatic brain injury, has a signature often that has too much delta, that very slow wave, and too much high beta in two regional areas, like, oh, there, and oh, there. That's very common. So when people come into our center and we do a brain map, and they've had a head trauma, I look for signatures, patterns. Do they have a pattern of having a head injury? And in your case, here's what we see. You have a significant amount of delta wave. That's why I mentioned that. Too much. Too much. Too much delta wave on this side of your brain, the right side of your brain, into the temporal lobe, which it has to do with memory. So it's running very slow, almost like you, here's the analogy I use. It's like having the brake on. Okay. Okay. And in your frontal lobe, you have too much high beta, which is like having the gas pedal pressed down. So you got the brake on and you got the gas pedal going. That's not so easy to get that car moving properly, right? No. <laughs> you might be spinning the tires. I mean, just using that analogy. So that's the, the overview of what's happening. So it is a signature for a traumatic brain injury. It is. It is. Too much delta and too much high beta in local regions. What regions? Temporal lobe, frontal lobe. Too much high beta in the frontal lobe contributes to anxiety. No question. No question. Then we go back to what we were saying before. What's going to be the best therapeutic intervention for this person to start to heal, if possible, develop neuroplasticity, if possible, and abate their symptoms, help them feel better? That's the way I think about things. What can we do to improve the function of this person's brain so that they feel better and can carry on with their life in a, in a contributing way, the way, with their family, with work, with their health? Um, yeah, that's what I'm looking at. So <clears throat> if that's what's going on with my brain and, and I went to your treatment center, what would be the next step? Well, there's numerous other tests that we would use. Okay to really dial in more data so that we can very precisely and specifically as much as we can 
target therapies. Okay. So let's go back to this. The right side of your brain, too much delta. So many of my therapies, for an example, might be from the left side of your body or from the left, your, through your left eye to drive more information to the right hemisphere. I may even use the vestibular apparatus in your inner ear on this side, which has to do with balance, because it has projections not only to balance, but to the frontal lobe, down to the brainstem, which is actually the expensive real estate. We need to analyze how the brainstem is functioning through special testing, because what we used to believe in brain injury is that it's up here, right, in a football helmet, where it hits here, or then it goes backward inside the helmet. Now we know that the head moves on a stalk, the brainstem. And that brainstem, when the head moves, it twists. And the torsion of that brainstem is what leads to many of the problems that we have. Cardiac issues, respiratory issues, gut issues, blood flow back to the head issues, migraine headaches. So going back to that other person who tried psychedelics, who developed migraines, Maybe the problem was in their default mode network because of the trauma, but maybe he had a problem in the brainstem that now boiled to the top because it needs a different therapy. Okay. And that's why we need better assessments on the front end so that the therapeutic intervention is more specific. I mean, can you get any more specific than being a special operator? No. The training is so precise, it's not general. So why don't we even think about that? Like, that's the way I kind of like to think in my non-military is be as precise and target this thing so you can get the best outcome in the shortest time. Okay. That's the goal. It's not always easy to get there, but that's the goal. And people say, well, you know, we want to have a proper hope when we are looking at people and what they're dealing with and how to help them restore. But they're, they're, in a way, there's always a hope how can you say that? Because we don't know what the brain cannot do. So I like to come in and in setting the proper expectation with people, help them understand that there's something maybe that you can do, you right? And so I say that because it's, it's easy to lose hope. You try a million things, you're suffering so badly. Um, we wanna restore hope. There, there are things that can be done and they may be able, and it may be multiple different things, but the, if they're targeted, you're going to get a better outcome. Okay. Yeah. You know, we kind of talked about this a little bit last night, but you know, one of the reasons I've never gone to get a brain scan or or, or anything, I've actually turned them down, is because I just always assumed, yep, I have a TBI, probably multiple TBIs. Yeah. And I've just had friend after friend, you know, from 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 my prior life telling me that they've got the brain scan and yes, all these things have happened and then they don't know what to do. So they try the hyperbaric chamber, some other things. Does the hyperbaric chamber, actually, does that work for traumatic brain injury? Out of Israel, they're finding dramatic results using hard chamber, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, at certain depths, certain pressures, and finding dramatic change. We use a soft chamber. And what I would say is, so there, there are potentially benefits. Just like there's potentially benefits with psychedelics. Okay. There's potentially benefits with the use of marijuana that's you know, properly dosed. So there's potential. What needs to be determined is what's the best fit based on what's going on in your brain. So. Again, go back to, okay, you entered the office. We're gonna do a series of other assessments using your eye tracking because eyes tell us dramatic things about the brain like they, in the NFL when they go into the tent, they look at how their eyes are moving. That's one of the standards for understanding if there's a brain injury. So we'll do eye tracking tests. We'll do balance and stability tests, standing on a foam cushion with your eyes closed and people's balance gets very wobbly. And so we can measure that very carefully because it tells us about areas of the brain putting on special goggles to see how you do in the dark, how your eyes move, how your eyes function. Sometimes we'll put those goggles on somebody and they can't see anything and one eye will just completely come in like cross-eyed. So it's telling us, oh, there's neural networks here that are disrupted. We'll do autonomic testing for the brainstem. It's a specialized 
heart evaluation and blood flow so we can know, is your brainstem operating properly? So as we start to separate all that data, we start to get a target. Th these are all things that you perform? Yes. Okay. And a proper examination. And so I would say that the people that do this kind of work are called, or at least most of them, are called functional neurologists. That's what I do. Functional neurology. And so that's what people would need to look for. Someone who works in functional neurology. Why? Because they're working with not only the data of what's going on in the brain from various sources like brain maps and things, but then what therapies can be now placed in order here? Or what we like to say is stacked together. We use a suite of therapies. So we'll have people will call and say, I tried hyperbaric, it didn't help me. I tried vision therapy and it was a little bit helpful. But when you put it all together, it's very different. What is going on with the hyperbaric chamber? Why, why is that working? Pressure is the magic, right? Your body can only hold so much oxygen. If you ever put one of these little devices on, a pulse oximeter, you can see, oh, 99. You can't take more than 100% oxygen into your body at atmospheric pressure. I mean, you know, um, regular, what am I trying to say there? I lost my word. Yeah. Just at, at room, room air, 21%. You can't put more than 100% in. But under pressure, based on laws of physics, Boyle's law, you can dissolve oxygen into the plasma. So you can go way beyond 100% because it's not going on the red blood cells, it's going to all the plasma. Now it can get into areas that it may not have been able to get before. That's why that works. So pressure is so, the magic. Okay. And I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna quote a friend of mine. Oxygen is the essential nutrient. Because people had questions on Patreon. What about what vitamins? And maybe we'll chat about that. It might be helpful. But oxygen is kind of a nutrient, right? Without oxygen, we're done. It's really the rate limiting nutrient. You can take the best of X, Y, Z, whatever. You might even be enjoying the gummy bears, which would be a good thing to enjoy. But you need oxygen. The brain needs oxygen, it needs glucose, and it needs activation. Okay. So the oxygen is really key to recovery, not only the brain, but everything in the body. So, and we know that longer term exposures to hyperbaric oxygen, even at low pressure, like the chamber we use, have dramatic benefits on even the cells of our body. Longevity mechanisms start kicking in. So some of these other, we won't go into the nomenclature, but you have different genes that get, start getting stimulated and those are gonna be better for longevity. But you have to have a certain amount of time under pressure. So hyperbaric is a very beneficial therapy when it's put together in the right order with things. Let me use an analogy, what I mean by order or stacking therapies, just to, to hit it right now. If you and I go to the gym and we work on bench press, and that's all we do, that's not bad. We'll feel it in our chest. But if we did bench press and we did flies and we did two other exercises for chest, we're gonna feel it a lot more. We stack together different things. Okay. So by doing, by assessing the whole person in this way, their brain and how they're, everything that inputs to the brain, we may use different therapies to, to get more of an uptick in that brain's ability to, to, to develop plasticity. So if I just did vision therapy with you, could be really good. And then let's say I did two or three other therapies and you're like, Wow, doc, I'm, I'm really like fatigued. My brain is fatigued, it was demanding. Now I'm gonna put you in the hyperbaric chamber and I'm gonna give you such a dose of oxygen, I'm gonna help you to recover faster. That's, that's the method that we use often. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.